we have such a large group this afternoon, we we'll ask you to use the chat function at the bottom of your screen so that you can send in your questions to Barry. Uh, we will try and answer as many of them as possible. Um, given the time constraint that we have and the amount of questions we've already received, uh, but that's not to say that if, if we don't get to them all that we won't address them. Uh, we have um, created a private discussion board on LinkedIn where we invite you to participate in the conversation uh, in between these live sessions with Professor McRae. And now I'd like to introduce to you um, my colleague and friend, Professor Barry McRae, whose steadfast devotion to the West of Ireland has been apparent from the start of Kylemore. Though he is born in Dublin, Barry's ancestry hails from the west of Ireland, and he has always shown a gra, which is Irish for love, uh, and a loyalty to, the, um, to its unique landscape, language, and people. Professor McRae is a scholar of comparative literature and a novelist whose research encompasses modern literature in English, French, Irish, Italian, and Spanish. He holds appointments at Notre Dame in the departments of English, Romance Languages, and Irish Language. Professor McRae divides his teaching between the Notre Dame campus and the Notre Dame Global Gateways in Ireland. Before joining Notre Dame's faculty, he taught at Yale, where he was appointed full professor of comparative literature in 2012. And he's the author of three book books and teaches seminars at all levels on topics such as James Joyce, the modern European novel, and modern Irish poetry. He regularly offers an undergraduate course on narrative and film, excuse me, narrative and fiction and film. And he's com currently completing a trilogy of novels tentatively entitled Docky. As you may know, when we promoted this event, we shared a few pre-recorded videos as homework uh, that are posted on Think ND. This is where Barry has provided very good overview of the topics that we'll be discussing. And for those of you who have not had a chance to watch them, I encourage you to go to Think ND and um, to have a look at them. Barry, a virtual welcome to you today at Kyle Moravi. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Can everybody hear me okay? Just wave if you can hear me like this. Um, okay. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm, I wish I could meet you all in person, and I hope that I will meet uh, some of you um, outside of the computer screen at some point. And I hope similarly that you, some of you will make your way, if you haven't already, to see Kyle Moore itself. It's uh, something, a place worth seeing. So I'm just going to talk to you for about five minutes um, to run over some of the main ideas in the videos that I assigned for homework. Uh, I always assume that my students have done the homework, but I know that um, you know some people do it more um, uh, diligently than others. So I'll just run through some of the main uh, the, the main features of the of this of the landscape, if you like, um, of what this course is going to be. Um, it's this is a, a course that I was initially I had, when the idea came to me, I was certain it was a bad one at the beginning because in my life of teaching literature, I usually think of literature as something that certainly offers us ways to enrich our lives and understand the world better, but not in an immediate way. For me, the kind of wisdom that literature usually gives us is something that is slow burning and cumulative. I don't think of literature as self-help usually, as a book you, you can just pull off the shelf in response to immediate concerns. But I think that what we're going through with the global pandemic is different. And that in this case, literature actually can be of a certain type of immediate assistance. Why is that? I suppose the first reason is that we are lacking a framework to attach our experiences to, a framework to map, our, if you like, an, an atlas on which to map our own experiences. This isn't the worst thing that has ever happened to anybody or the worst thing that's ever happened to the world. People, some of, maybe some of you, have seen wars, for example, even famines, things that are worse than this. But it is different from anything else. None of us have been through a global pandemic before. And in fact, very few of us even have parents who can remember a global pandemic unless they lived through the Spanish flu of 1918. So it's very hard for us, with, it's very hard for us to manage this psychologically without having something to measure our experience against, to relativize it. 
And one of the paradoxes which is related to this, one of the paradoxes about our experience is that something is happening to everybody at the same time, but that something is also very lonely. And it's a very strange combination, something that is happening to everybody that is also very lonely. One of the reasons for this is that because it's happening to everybody, you can't really talk about it. You can't call up your friend and say, oh my God, this terrible thing has happened to me. There's been an outbreak of a contagious disease and I'm shut up at home all the time. I can't go because it's happening to everybody else. So even though we know it's happening to everybody else, it's an almost universal experience in some ways, it's also very lonely. We don't have a precedent for it and we don't have ways of talking about it. It also affects us. This experience affects us at the deepest psychological levels. Obviously our first concern is for bodily health, our own and that of the people we love and even of people we don't know. We're mostly worried about sickness of the body, but the effects on our psychology of this are enormous and they can't be underestimated. And I think we'll talk about this later. I think the true psychological effects of this experience are only going to become apparent as the lockdown fully eases. But to run through the, the main reasons, the main of psychological effects that I think living through a pandemic has, um, that I mentioned in the, in, the, in the videos online. First is our sense of time, how we perceive time passing, the rate at which time passes, and especially our sense of the future. In a pandemic, especially a disease that we don't know, so we don't know how to control, we don't even fully know what it is, what its story will be. That makes it very hard for us to picture the future, to project ourselves into the future. And that is an absolutely fundamental part of human identity. No matter how old you are or what, what situation you're in, the ability to predict yourself, in, to project yourself rather into the future, it's a fundamental part of identity that has been taken away from us right now. Our sense of self has also been changed, has also been compromised. We're cut off from our routines and routines are something else that give us a very, uh, constitute a very fundamental part of our identity. We're cut off from our communities, not just families and friends, but also uh, sport, workplaces, leisure places. Finally, our relationship to other people has been distorted. We are a gregarious species, human beings. We I, I have, I think, a, physiological, a biological need to be around other people, even people outside our, in our, our kinship group. And right now, and it's nobody's fault, but right now we perceive other people and other people's bodies as threats to our well-being. And in fact, we also perceive, perceive ourselves as potential threats to the well-being of others. We cross the, stroke, cross the street to avoid each other. We don't touch each other, we don't talk. We are forced to put distance between ourselves and what we want to do is be close. However, this experience, which is so strange and so unnerving for us as individuals has a long, long, long history in our species. In fact, it's perhaps been one of the most common experiences throughout history. It's one of the most frequently recurring human experiences, you might say. And so this course and reading these texts and thinking about them together is a way of generating some company for ourselves to spend some time with people who have been through something similar, even in very different circumstances, very different historical moments. Not everything on this course is set in a pandemic or comes from a pandemic. Next week, we're going to look at the Decameron, which very, which very much does. It's very explicitly about the Black Death in Florence, uh, about the experience of it and how to survive it. Um, but after that, we're going to look at a film that probably most of you have seen already called Rear Window. In fact, this, um, this strange Zoom setup where I see you all in little boxes reminds me of Rear Window, um, now, I, now I think of it. Uh, and this is obviously not a film that's set in a plague, but it is set in a kind of quarantine. And I think it's a film that's about what happens when the external stimuli to the mind are reduced and the ways in which when that happens, the internal stimuli of the mind increase. Uh, in other words, it's a film about how quarantine allows us to observe aspects of the mind of our psycho psychology. It's also, and I think this will be something very important to us as the lockdowns are all over the world start to, to ease, it's a film that is partly about the difficulty of recalibrating one's 
sense um, one's relationship with the outside world after a quarantine. The last text we're going to read is a novel by the French novelist Albert Camus, The Plague. And the true genius of this book, I think, has only been revealed to us. It was written in the 40s, but it's only been revealed to us now. Camus never lived through a plague. He would never live through a pandemic. His, his book is a vivid imagining of what that would feel like, which people up to now have taken as an allegory for many things. So not really about a plague at all, but a kind of symbolic story using the plague for something else. But when we read it now, the COVID-19 generation that we are, you'll find that it is uncannily similar to our own experience. Um, and again, and I think that's why it's a good text to end with, it's a, it's a novel that is about, in part, about the difficulties of exiting a pandemic situation, the difficulties of leaving lockdown. It's easier, Camus suggests, to get into lockdown than it is to get out of it in certain ways. So what we're going to do now um, is send you all into uh, classrooms together um, to, uh, I suppose part of the idea of this is that you're going to get to know other people a little bit who are in, who are taking the course. So we're going to shortly uh, send you into automated breakout rooms. So what I'd like to happen in these rooms is a few things. The first thing you need to do, so it'll be, it will be like jury duty. You're going to have to choose uh, a leader. And um, I encourage you to be uh, gender blind in picking a leader. Sometimes when I do this with my students, all the boys become leaders. Um, so try and avoid that. We'd like a mixed gender group of leaders. Um, and then I'd like you all to introduce yourselves to each other. So just say something about um, why you took this, decided to take this course, maybe where you are in the world, and then discuss these two questions. First of all, was there anything in my uh, pre-recorded lectures that speaks to a specific part of your experience of lockdown? To be as specific as you can, if there's anything in my lectures that speaks to a specific experience of yours in lockdown. And second, were there any questions that you were left with after listening, watching rather, my lectures. So they're the two things I'd like you to discuss. Um, your leader will report back using the chat function, will report back the um, results of your conversation. Um, please be nice to each other, be polite, listen as well as talk. Um, and if for some reason you don't like it in the classroom, you can leave and come back to the main room at any time. We're not locking you in. You can just um, stay for as long as you want and then come back. Um, so we're going to send you into these rooms now for um, about eight or nine minutes, and I'll see you when you get back. Thanks for um, that little experiment. I hope it went well. I'm sorry if we whisked you back uh, to a little too quickly, but time is of the essence and we only have a bit of uh, a half an hour left and we've got some great questions already that have been posed to the group. But I hope that you understand from, um, from, from that experience that the effort is to build community and is to, 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 to get a sense of who we're gonna be engaging with over the, the next few weeks. And um, I just, as, as Barry mentioned before, I would like each of your room leads to use the chat function now, which is at the bottom of your screen right beside the participant list. And if the, if the lead can um, share a couple of the key takeaways you got from the questions that Barry um, posed prior to the breakout, then if you just put them into the chat, um, think Andy will fire them off to me. So in light of that, I'm gonna start with one of uh, the first few questions that we've already received in advance of this session to Barry. Before Lisa does that, can I just uh, add in one thing, which is to remind you that if you don't, um, in the coming weeks, if you don't want to go into a breakout room, that's fine. You can just stay in the main room and um, you know make yourself a cup of coffee or something and then wait for us all to come back. So it's not, it's not compulsory. We'll send you into them, but you, can, you don't have to. You can stay in the main room if you like. And if you don't know how to do that, um, if, if you email the Think ND team, they'll tell you how to do it. Barry, so are we ready for our first question? 
It seems the documentation of plagues have been detailed in literature since human beings began congregating in communities. I wonder if Professor McRae can comment about the plagues documented in the Bible, specifically the book of Exodus, at which time the plagues inflicted upon the Egyptians sought to the emancipation of a people from slavery. Plagues have served useful in the past for political movements. Wow, that's, that's such a smart question. Um, to, to see the link in Exodus between the liberation of the Hebrews and um, the preceding 10 plagues. I suppose, you know, the Bible is, um, the, despite the Old Testament especially, is obviously an accretion of human experiences over a very long period of time, um, compressed into narrative form. And so one of the things that we see from these very graphic descriptions of plagues in the book of Exodus is just how important the experience of plagues has been to humanity. That it's one of, in fact, one of the chief experiences people have had um, that has affected them in all sorts of ways, their religious beliefs, their political life, their social life, even their, their, their uh, sexual and psychological lives, that uh, the experience of plague has been absolutely fundamental. That's the first thing we see from it. Uh, it is interesting, and I never thought of it before, that uh, in the book of Exodus, the plagues are followed by uh, what we might call political upheaval, which is something I mentioned in relation to ancient Greece in one of the um, pre-recorded lectures, that there is often a, a, a connection at least perceived between plagues and political change or political tumult. And so I think the first thing it shows us is just what a fundamental part of human experience it has been. Um, okay, our next question. Um, plague literature reveals incongruities between class and social stratification. What is it about pandemics that unveil societal constructs that up until the affliction we were willing to ignore? I suppose we think of our social and economic systems as happening automatically in a way, as being almost natural things, um, but they're not. They require the participation of all sorts of people um, in all sorts of different circumstances in life in ways that are fundamentally unjust. Um, and once ordinary life is difficult to arrange, once it's difficult to put together and manage, then that chain becomes visible. Um, it also becomes visible to us that food doesn't just arrive on, on our supermarket shelves, you know, by miracle. It, it involves an awful lot of labor and uh, activity on the part of other human beings. Um, so in a sense, it, what it reveals is the relationships between us all. First of all, on the very simple level of contagion that um, because because we're, the issue, what's at issue is a contagious disease, one that we spread to each, from one person to another, we see that we're connected. But then also in this secondary sense, that because, uh, the once the, 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 the chains and the systems that, that make up our society, the, the machinery of our society, if you like, once those things become visible, we see what the relationships between all of us and how those relationships are often unjust or compromised um, or straining, um, or, or, or where they can go wrong. I suppose we can also see where they go right too, but we especially see where they go wrong. Now we go to Shakespeare. Uh, this question came in on Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. You have Mercutio condemn the two families, a plague upon both of your houses. There is this equivocation that plagues are a result of a wrongdoing or some sort of sin or malfeasance. What does this reveal about human nature, Barry? Well, you know, if you watch uh, cable news um, in the US, uh, everybody's trying to come up with a hot take on the pandemic. Um, you know, everybody's kind of trying to explain the pandemic to us. Um, every, every pundit wants a kind of moment on TV in which they get to, but in truth, we can't, to have a take on it or to think you can have a take on it, is a delusion because a plague really, I mean, 
it's more complicated than that. But basically, a plague arises in nature. It's not something that we make ourselves. And nature is fundamentally indifferent to us, to our politics, to our, to our, to our social systems, to our desires, to our beliefs. Nature doesn't care. And I think when you say a plague on both your houses, um, imagining a plague is somehow connected to human affairs, that's a desire we have to try and understand a plague in our own terms, to try and sort of domesticate it, if you like, into the human world, even though it's, it is outside the human world. And one of the things that is so difficult about living through a pandemic is just that, that we're talking, that is, in a way, it's a question of scale, that we're talking about something that is so much bigger than the world of human affairs, that is very hard for our human brains to process it. And things that are hard for our brains to process, we turn into uh, superstition or magic, or in this case, uh, curses with Romeo and Juliet. And one of, the, one of the fascinating but difficult challenges of living through a pandemic is how to repair, I think, the relationship between the human and the world and the natural world, uh, which is, um, it's not corrupted, but it is, um, uh, it's, it's uh, cast into doubt by living through a period of contagious illness. Our next question, um, history has much to teach us about the spread of this invisible enemy. Scientists and writers have predicted that another epidemic was, was bound to happen, bound to come, and yet lawmakers, politicians, and the general public seem to be um, caught unawares to the extent to which a pandemic or this pandemic can affect us. Why are we so quick to ignore the past lessons from history and what literature had to provide for us? Well, um, there's, there's a reason that I'm not a professor of history and that I am a professor of literature. And I think that's it. Um, you know, it's easy to ignore history because we didn't see it with our own eyes. Um, we weren't there. Um, and also I, in the little, I was in one of the breakout rooms earlier on and we were talking about the news and the limits, um, the, the, the limited nature of what the news can tell us that watching the news or reading the news that that can tell us something about our situation, something about the pandemic, but, but there are limits too. There are things that it can't tell us. And history is the same, I think. Um, because you have to abstract individual experiences into a kind of a collective story to turn it into history, we lo you lose the very intimate feeling of living through something that each individual has to go through. So the reason that I think fiction is helpful is exactly is like exactly this. It can tell us what it feels like to be in a pandemic, to be one person in a pandemic. You know, not France or um, something. Um, you can't feel like France because France isn't a person. So these abstractions that history requires on are very helpful and interesting, and we can, if we are very intellectually rigorous, we can learn from it. Well, we can't learn from it is what it feels like to be in it. And I think that's the only, I mean, not quite the only way, but it's a key way in which we cannot repeat um, mistakes of the past or in which we can at least take the past on board is by reading literature for that reason that it shows us what it feels like to be an individual in a set of circumstances rather than just describing those circumstances to us in an abstract way. Thanks, Barry. Um, surviving a plague gives us a heightened sense of being mortal. But the way in which people deal with the lockdown are quite different. From living in isolation and austerity, austerity um, example here is stocking up on toilet paper, etc., cetera, um, to living to all sorts of excess and overindulgence. What can literature reveal about the polarity of the human response? Well, I suppose the first thing to say, isn't it, is something we all know, which is that um, it's always hard to be poor and the poor are never the winners, no matter what happens. And so that's, for me, the biggest polarity, um, as the, the person used that word polarity, is between the people who have plenty of resources to protect themselves or distract themselves and people who don't. Um, but that, moving beyond that, you know, both the things mentioned, stocking up on 
toilet paper um, and living to excess, they're the same instinct, um, I think, which is to try and do something on an individual level to protect oneself against what's outside. But the truth is, um, they're almost, um, what's the word, um, superstitious uh, activities. And that's why I saw the the kind of the crazy run on um, toilet paper that there was in the US um, when I was reading about it, that looked to me like an almost superstitious act, you know, a way to, um, to, to, to imagine that by accumulating this, this good, um, and it was kind of a random good, I mean, it could have been tin beans or, um, I don't know, flashlights or something, but it, it, it just, it, it came to take on this almost religious significance as almost a talisman that would, um, uh, protect the human world from the natural world outside. So in a way, the experiences are not that dissimilar on a psychological level, even if on a material level, it is much easier for people who have a nice house and a, a nice apartment or um, good um, Netflix ac uh, access or whatever it is. Well, we get more of that in the Decameron for next week too, don't we? Um, okay. Uh, one of the questions that's come in now is um, people were struck by the passage of time, some in routine while others finding it difficult to get into a routine. Individuals also commented on the feeling of uncertainty and lack of planning was unsettling and cited the unpenetrable forest. Another insight was around the tension between being responsible in quarantine while also meeting life and family demands of community. How will our communities emerge post pandemic? I suppose what happens, I think, um, what literature at least tells us that happens in a situation like this um, is not that new things happen, but that existing tendencies are accelerated. Um, and sometimes those tendencies haven't been visible to us before the pandemic. So the way the world was heading before the pandemic is going to go more quickly after it. That said, Things are never only heading in one direction, they're usually heading in competing directions. And so aspects of the society we were living in before the plague are going to be exaggerated and sped up. Um, but we don't yet know which aspects it's going to be. So there's very simply, there's two in, in terms of um, say economic life. There are, some people say, oh, the box stores are all going to take over now because there are they're the only companies with the po pockets deep enough to survive the hit that they've taken. Other people say, well, actually, you know, we were all moving back to shopping local. In fact, local stores are the ones that have um, generated the most uh, new business and loyalty during the pandemic. So we don't know which one of those tendencies is going to win out. But it, one thing, if we're going to take what, what literature tells us, um, one thing that we can, I think, rely upon is that it won't be some new tendency, some new world that comes out of nowhere, but exaggerated or accelerated aspects of the world we were living in before. What it seems to be that um, moments of mass disruption like a plague accelerate or exaggerate or kind of turn up the volume on things that were already perhaps invisibly happening before. Well, that leads into a question um, that we had sent in. Uh, were most literary works commenting on are using the backdrop of plagues published soon after the events or much later? Just wondering when we'll expect to see such works after our COVID-19 experiences and are there literary works yet exploring the impact of using the backdrop of the Ebola virus? You know, so there's some very good things that are written just after the Decameron is one. It was written at the very end of the Black Death um, and published just after it in Florence. Um, but more often, I think there's a delay. That um, if I think of novels that I admire, James Joyce's Ulysses, published in 1922, but set in 1904, or George Eliot's Middlemarch, published also 30 years after it was set. Um, there's lots of them. Uh, I think there's a kind of a sweet spot of a couple of decades when writers have enough hindsight to be able to uh, um, describe in a useful way uh, events. So I wouldn't, I, I'm not looking forward to 
a spate of COVID novels in the next five years. But I would love to know to read a COVID novel in 10 or 20 years. That's my feeling. I suppose <laughs> what has also been fed in, and I'm gonna follow up with this, is um, a question that came from one of the groups is, does the consciousness of a global pandemic, in your opinion, enhance or in fact stifle creativity then? If you're saying it's going to happen 30 years on, maybe like, do you think it's it's there's time that needs to be mediated? Well, I think none of us are going to be the same coming out of this thing as we were going in. Um, I think that's we can say that for society that we're not going to be in the same society we were in before, and none of us as individuals is going to be the same afterwards. At the same time, as I said before, um, what will be different is an acceleration or exaggeration of tendencies that were already there. And that's probably true on the individual level too. I think that literature in a strange way is almost indifferent um, to these sorts of global events. Most of the great novels of the First World War aren't about the First World War. Most of the novels written during it, I mean. Uh, I, I actually think the literary world and the literary imagination is uh, uh, strangely, not quite immune is an unfortunate term to use, I suppose, but um, is autonomous, is really separate from, from that world. It's one of the great things about it that it remains safe. And I never worry for human creativity or the possibilities of human creative expression because um, you know, one of the books that I was thinking of putting on this syllabus was uh, Primo Levi's um, memoir of being in Auschwitz, if this is a man. And um, if you read that, it's one I highly recommend it, um, just apart from the historical value of it, just as a literary work, it's uh, extraordinary. And even there, you can see him, um, how during his time in Auschwitz, his reading of literature, his memories of literature uh, were vital for him. And you sort of think that if you're in a situation as extreme as that, that literature would be a luxury or a frippery, something you wouldn't, uh, but in fact, uh, Primo Levi relied on it for his psychic survival when he was in the camp. And you, you would never say his experience of the war enhanced his creativity, but his creativity remained intact throughout it. I think they're separate. I think literature is the, the great blessing of um, being able to shield itself from everything that happens outside it, bomb proof. Which is a grace for us all. Um, I have from group 18, this is a, a question of uh, one of our members who works with the Jungian Psych Institute was talking about the stages of grief and how we're grieving our lost lives as well as the physical loss of life. And yet we're hesitant to re-enter life. Mm -hmm. Can Professor McRae speak to the tension between grief of lost life and the difficulty of re-entering normal life? Well, it's a great, that's a really great point. And I think, um, somebody said to me in the middle of this, in fact, uh, what we're doing is grieving, and I found it a very helpful way to think about it. Um, but as anybody who's experienced bereavement knows, grief is a very complicated thing. And it's especially, it's a hard thing to let go of. And I think that is probably the next uh, phase in our psychological journey in the pandemic, is figuring out how to let go of our grief. Because we're not going to get back the world we had before even if things look like they did before, we've all, we're all going to have lost a certain innocence. We're never going to be able to take certain things for granted anymore. That we took for granted for the whole of our lives, you know, going to a bar or a restaurant or a football game, those things we can't, we can't, won't be able to take for granted anymore. So something uh, really has been lost. Uh, and I think psychoanalysts like Jung and also Freud have very useful things to say about how to manage grief. And one of the things is that at a certain point you notice that you're holding on to your grief very deliberately, that you're, oh, you're kind of putting it inside yourself and storing it there. In fact, even, you know, not to get too psychobabbly, but even this thing about the accumulating toilet rolls, I see something of that in it, an attempt to kind of um, um, hoard things or build them up or hold them in. And the, the instinct when you're coming to the end of, a, of grieving is to hold your grief inside as though it is going to protect you. And it feels um, 
it's very difficult because you make yourself very vulnerable to let go of it. And that's, that's, the, that's the phase we're all, I think, about to face now. But Boccaccio and Camus have something to say, and actually Hitchcock have something to say about that. I feel like there's a lot of questions coming in about like the re-emerging out of this, like this, uh, like how have you any, one of the questions is have you any advice, uh, perhaps literature of how we can come up better after this chaotic experience? Um, during the pandemic, um, people feel that they're suffering in very different ways, experiencing loss, as we mentioned before, in varied levels. And there's this kind of moral obligation to suffer silently because of this. Is there a societal benefit in downplaying what individual suffering? It's not that was kind of the British um, idea in the war, wasn't it? You know, um, blitz spirit, you know, let's not complain and just dodge the bombs. Um, you know, I, I, I believe that anything that is repressed always returns. It's never gone. And um, usually if it's repressed, it returns in a frightening form. Um, so it's better not to repress usually, um, unless it's going to really hurt somebody else not to do it. And I suppose if in terms of advice, you know, I, I don't know, but one thing would be to try and experience this collectively as much as possible to find ways to experience this, not just um, alone as individuals. Um, so in that sense, I think complaining is not helpful. Um, so while we shouldn't repress things, we should express things, complaining you know, individualizes something when in fact what we have is something collective. So I don't mean don't express frustration or, um, I guess I'm meaning complaining about others because the thing that's going to help us most, I suspect, is um, um, by becoming attached to others again. And I don't mean to specific others, you know, I don't mean your grandchildren, or, but I mean to strangers. And one of the, I guess one of the hardest things we're going to have to do is to learn not to fear each other again, because we've all been trained now to be afraid of each other in all, lots of ways, to think that we might give each other an infection, but um, um, we might take all the toilet roll. Um, we might go out without wearing a mask or we might um, be annoyed that people are wearing masks or that um, we're very worried about uh, or feel that we might be harmed by or upset by the actions of other people around us. And I think the first thing to do is, I suspect is to try and unfear, to try and um, really work on this instinct that we've all developed through no fault of our own to, to be afraid of others, especially uh, strangers. That the thing that will help us most through it, I suspect is that. Um, I know we're running shorter on time, but I would like to end with a question that I like concerns our students, which I always love to bring um, into uh, these topics. One of the students, uh, excuse me, one of the questions was about your own experience of teaching this class to our students. And um, could you give us a kind of soundbite version of, of, of what, how they responded to the content that you presented in this online version of your course? And you, uh, you know, and you were quick to create the class and very quick to get the enrollment. So I, I'm curious and others are curious as, as how our students responded to the content of your material. Um, so they wrote to me afterwards, quite a lot of them, and uh, the, I think the overriding emotion was one of relief, um, that they, to, to, to see this experience recorded elsewhere, um, not just specifically in the literature that's about living through pandemic, but also even in, in Rear Window and these, these other kind of analogous situations, um, that they felt very lonely. And uh, this is, as I said, it's a very lonely experience, and the students, um, the, the overriding feeling was one of relief. Uh, a lot of grief was expressed too. Um, and you know, it's very hard to be young in this. I mean, it's it's one of the situations where something is, something very valuable has been taken away from them that nobody can give back to them. Um, and I, I think especially the discussions about time and the ability, the inability rather to, to envision the future, it was just help. It didn't make it better. It doesn't solve it, but just to talk about it, to see that other people, not just now, but hundreds of years ago, um, felt similar things uh, was very helpful. It was a way of feeling a togetherness 
in what is a very otherwise very individual and lonely experience. Thanks, Barry. And I want to thank uh, all of our participants this afternoon. I really appreciate you uh, joining us today. And uh, we didn't get to a quarter of the questions that were, were um, put on our boards. So I really encourage you and invite you to continue the conversation on our LinkedIn discussion board that ThinkND has created for this um, program course that we're leading over the next few weeks. And um, in addition for next week's meeting, please read the introduction and uh, first story of Boccaccio's to Cameron. Uh, in addition, part two is now on Think Andy and uh, with shorter kind of explain, explainer videos by Barry. Um, so please review and your homework is to come prepared <laughs> uh, to discuss next week. But also feel free to share this to uh, your friends and family and the series uh, it's open and, and it's free and online to all. And we really are hoping to, uh, to reach as many people as possible and bring a bit of Kyle Moore to everyone uh, during this time. So we're accepting registrations throughout the entire program. Um, and each in each meeting and each, each time we meet and come together, it's, uh, it's a standalone discussion. Uh, and so, Thanks again for taking the time to be with us and Barry uh, for uh, giving us such an insightful um, conversation this afternoon and to you all for taking the time for being with us. Slán. Um. <laughs>